Hi, everybody. Welcome to a Friday Fireside Chat. I'm Rita McGrath. You probably knew that already. Uh, this is being recorded, so do not say anything you do not wish the New York Times, your mother, your girlfriend, or other important people in your life to know about. Um, and my guest this week is Julie Lithcott Hames, who is famous for many things, but one of the things that she's most famous for right now is her new book called Your Turn, How to Be an Adult. And it uh, fo follows her New York Times bestselling book on helicopter parroting, which really put that phrase on the lips of, of everybody, you know, made us aware of that. Um, you know, she's got a degree from Stanford. She's got a degree from Harvard Law School, real underachiever here. Um, so if you have questions, please pop them in the chat. I don't tend to use the raise hand feature so much because I don't, I never know who's attending these things. Um, so Julie, welcome. Rita, thank you so much for having me. Great to be with you and your listeners. Oh, it's a real pleasure. So, you know, for those that don't know you, maybe give us a little flavor of your journey so far and, you know, how you came to write these amazing books, because they really are, they're very human. You know, they're really personal, sort of vulnerable. They tell a lot of true stories. Uh, and I think it's a writing style that not many people master well, and you certainly have. So uh, tell, tell us about your journey. Well, that's a lovely way to start my Friday. I appreciate that, Rita. Thank you. Um, I'm a 53-year-old Black biracial woman. I was born to a white British mother and an African-American father uh, for whom um, being in love was uh, the transgression of society's rules. I come from people who loved each other enough um, to be together when they weren't supposed to. Um, the act of conceiving me, giving birth to me, was a transgressive act in the 1960s. So I feel that I came into this world out of bounds. I have always lived in the liminal spaces between the boxes that society likes to put humans in. I uh, moved around a lot as a kid. My father was in public health, helped eradicate smallpox, was Jimmy Carter's assistant surgeon general. We moved in furtherance of um, the acceleration of his career opportunities. So I was always the new kid. I was always the outsider, being biracial, um, being a light-skinned Black person, which was unusual in the 70s and 80s when I was coming up. And so I think in the aggregate that has given me tremendous empathy for humans who find themselves on the outskirts or on the margins of life, who find themselves misunderstood or unseen um, or misattributed. Um, and um, so my tagline on my website, I think, is I root for humans. And I'm telling you the why behind that. I root for humans because I have often not been rooted for. Mm -hmm. And um, I have felt the pain of that. And I have tremendous empathy for, for all of us, uh, and particularly those who might be marginalized. Um, um, I, my careers have been law. Uh, I was a lawyer for four years. I became a university administrator. I was dean of freshmen, ultimately at Stanford for 10 years, working with young adults, helping them forge their path. And my writing career has really emanated from that. The helicopter parenting book was in response to a deep concern and growing concern of mine and that of countless administrators and faculty on countless campuses across the United States about how childhood had changed and therefore how college students had changed. And um, the book is really me rooting for young people to be unfettered, um, to not be on anybody's leash or micromanaged. And so this new book is a compliment really to that one. Um, this is finally the book for young people who may be struggling with emerging into this phase of life that is simply where we all are if we survive childhood. I love that. I love that notion that this is, is, it really is a universal experience. And, you know, one of the things that I was thinking as I read it was how different those coming of age years are in the midst of this pandemic um, and how much harder it is. You know, I mean, it's always been hard to be a young adult uh, and any number of coming of age memes will tell you that, but to be, to be in that mode where you can't, be with your tribe where you can't get out of the house where you're, you know, somebody knows where you are every second of the day. I mean, have you been making observations about, is it really different? I, I, I think it must be. Absolutely. I mean, we've all been suffering in our own ways, depending on our age and stage and circumstance and what we've endured before. Uh, for young adults, this has been a disruption of uh, a pretty 
a, a lockstep plan forward. Childhood has always seemed to come lately, at least with a lockstep plan. We always know what's next. We know what we're supposed to do this coming August or September. The school year has a rhythm to it. Uh, college has a rhythm to it. Entering the workplace has always had a rhythm. And all of these rhythms have been disrupted and when your life has been led in lockstep, the minute you, there's no longer a lockstep, I imagine it feels that you've fallen through a trap door. In addition, the rituals that help form a sense of belonging to place, to self, to society um, have been disrupted by this pandemic. So there are all kinds of reasons why I think if you are young and trying to emerge out into college or the workplace, you're feeling this sort of, where did my roadmap go? Where did my touchstones or my guard, my, my not my guardrails, my, the banister I might have gently put my hand along as I made my way out, where is that? Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a hard time. And yet we know that when humans go through hard times, we have the capacity to emerge from that so much stronger, so much clearer on who we are and what we want and what we do not want. There's nothing like the restriction of a pandemic to teach you what really matters about relationship, about work, about uh, the larger sense of who am I. So I think that there's this opportunity for this terrible experience to really catalyze and um and provide velocity to young people to get out there. Yes, it is bewildering and overwhelming, always has been to emerge out into adulthood and figure it out. Um, but I think there is something about this hardship they've been through that has the chance to sharpen them in good ways, uh, not sharpen, not, not to close them off, but to make them more honed and focused around, all right, this is my one wild and precious life, quoting the po late poet Mary Oliver, what shall I do with it? I'm clearer than ever that it is finite and that I must not take time, people, opportunities for granted. I think um, one of the things that, that I've observed, you know, and, and we've been on these conversations together in some cases where people were like, you know, I just sleepwalked into this life where I thought nothing of getting on a plane and going to Singapore for a three hour talk and flying back again. <laughs> some of us had a little contest going around, like what was the most ridiculous thing you did like for a one shot thing? Yeah. Um, and I wonder how that's all going to change. I really think uh, I'm hearing from so many people like why did I waste so many precious breaths in airport lounges, you know, which, which yeah. is a high class problem to have on the one hand, but yeah. on the other, it's, it's, it's like, why did I just assume this was normal? And that was a really good way to live my life. Yeah. I speak for a living. Um, speaking is 80% of my revenue. So I have had to pay close attention to these matters. And um, I've been delighted that my speaking career has managed to still thrive via Zoom, um, which takes so much effort to connect with people through this webcam. You know, you work hard at it. I work hard at it. <laughs> totally. So people with audiences come like, hey, we'll listen to you, even though it's all virtual. But I've also learned in this year, Rita, um, that being in my house is wonderful. I'm in a 33-year <laughs> relationship with a dude I met in college. He's called my husband. Um, <laughs> I have loved being in my house and seeing him every day and my two kids have been back and oh, nice. I'm trying to figure out what does this mean for me professionally? Might I need to develop some different sources of revenue so that I don't have to get on planes constantly and be in cities for three hours or three days um, in order to, um, you know, to earn the income I'm trying to earn. So mm -hmm. it's, it's woken me up for sure to, mm -hmm. Uh, to what I want. Mm -hmm. And I think I thought the traveling was glamorous and, and I certainly love being with people. Yeah. You know, I think if I could magically get to be with humans in person without all the time associated with travel and hotels and all of that, mm -hmm. I would do that in an instant. Unfortunately, yeah. we're not technologically advanced enough yet to just transport to I another. Can, I, I can highly recommend, I did a holographic thing and it really worked. I could see the audience, they could see me and I was beamed into um, Hong Kong <laughs> and I was in New York. The only, the, that's sorry? Amazing. I said, holy moly, that's it, amazing. It was, I it was great. That. Okay. The only thing, the only thing I would warn you about, it was my morning. It was like six in the morning for me and it was their evening and they all got to go off and have cocktails and I had right. to go work. <laughs> that was a bummer. Exactly. So um, let's talk a little bit about one of the sections in the book, which is called How to Cope. Um, and we've got some questions in the chat from folks who are kind of curious about when you hit those difficult moments, like what are the, what are the things that really like, helped you get through it? And um, 
and you've got a, a chapter specifically calling out 12 steps to surviving <laughs> and I'll leave the rest of the sentence un unsaid, but you know, when something really, really bad happens, right? <laughs> okay, yes. I was wondering, are we not allowed to swear on your podcast? Oh, uh, you're allowed. You're totally allowed. <laughs> the chapter is that folks back at home. The chapter is called how to cope when the shit hits the fan. And it's in a book on adulting because the shit will hit the fan. Um, this chapter and throughout the book, I'm trying to make the point that much is out of your control. Chaos is normal. Um, all that you can really be in control of, in charge of, is yourself if you work hard at it. Mm -hmm. And I will explain mindfulness and I will explain self-awareness and self-love and these various things that we can get better at in order to be more in charge of our own actions and reactions. Um, this chapter is saying, you know, how will you be when the bad stuff happens? And I think the short answer to your question is, Rita, humans. Mm. Humans are key to our survival, which is a point I make in the earlier chapter about relationships. And it is humans whom you need to count on in times of crisis. The epigraph of that uh, chapter is Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, that many of us know of from our childhood, um, who said, look for the helpers. And the point is when you are in trouble, you've got to find those humans around you, whether it's a car crash or cancer diagnosis, a natural disaster, you find yourself having done something terrible and you're being held accountable. I mean, sometimes the disaster is of our own making and I acknowledge that too. We've got a set of humans around us, we hope, who love us no matter what and will show up for us in our times of need Expecting reciprocity there, of course. We are in a mutually interdependent species, and there's nothing like a crisis to remind us that humans are everything. And so I try to tell you've alluded to the fact that I have a lot of vulnerable narrative in this book. I am a memoirist. I, I believe in trying to tell the truth of our lived experience to the extent we can bear it to help other humans feel seen and less alone and more supported. So in this chapter, I do a deep exploration in memoir of a series of years from age when I was age 20 to 26, when I um, survived a pretty scary earthquake experience here in California. Uh, my father got a cancer diagnosis. I enrolled at Harvard Law School. I find out, I get married. I find out my brother is dying and dies within two months of that. My father then dies. I start, uh, I've started work at a law firm and I'm taken out to lunch and told by the partners at my law firm that I need to get my hours up. And I go to grief counseling for the first time, having gone through these things, which I had just ignored, 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 put blinders on, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm high achieving, look at me, I'm amazing, while just fragile and hollow inside, I go to grief counseling in a group session held by CARA Group Grief Counseling here in Palo Alto, and I meet a guy named Thane, a white gay guy who's like eight years older than me, but we're the youngest in the group, everyone else is in their 50s and 60s, we're in our 20s and 30s, and he and I become this lifeline for one another. He's just lost his mother. I've lost my father. That is my most recent acute loss, but I've got this stacked up set of fears that I'm still. And Thane became this friend in therapy um, who was my lifeline, my blanket. Um, and Thane and I have rarely met socially, Rita, over these decades, but Thane will show up on Facebook when something good happens in my life. Thane will post, your father would be so proud. Aww. And that brings tears to my eyes, just retelling it to you, right? Thane and I, when you go through a challenging, emotional, gut-wrenching experience with somebody or you're unpacking loss with somebody, you know each other at the molecular level of care. And that never goes away. Never. And Thane and I are that mutual thing for each other. And anyway, so I'm trying to illustrate in that chapter that how essential and transformative one great human relationship can be when you're struggling. We don't need a, we don't need a village. I mean, villages are important for other reasons, but when we're suffering, when we're struggling, one or two people who we know care deeply uh, will make all the difference. And we need to, of course, show up and be that person um, as appropriate. Mm -hmm. It's it's a deeply moving chapter, and and those stories, my God. Um, so um, 
talk a little bit about your husband because he sounds like uh, <laughs> he sounds like quite the character <laughs> and very successful relationship, right? Thirty three years now. Um, I'm going to reach for a Mother's Day gift he gave me. Ah. I do allude to this in the book. So Dan Lithcott Hames, uh, best thing that has ever happened to me in a lifetime that has offered many beautiful and wonderful things. Um, Dan is an artist. Dan is also a user experience designer. So that's sort of the, uh, he can make money from user experience design. His heart and soul is that of an artist. And um, Dan is, I've always said more evolved than me. He seems to have a calmness, a, a, he lacks insecurity. He's not full of hubris. He's not, you know, he's just sort of calm and centered and, 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 and just certain. And I feel like I've been the younger soul, uh, constantly bombarding, hitting walls. And, you know, I've got the rough edges and Dan, I used to describe as a smooth river rock, you know, as if he's just been smoothed by millennia. Um, and, um, so Dan is in the book in a lot of places and he's in, he's been on my mind a lot in this pandemic, in this speaking mode of mine, because people are always asking me, what should we do? And how do we, you know, how do we write? And I, and I always picture Dan because Dan showed up early in the pandemic in a way that, um, was just breathtaking. Dan, rolled over in bed one day on a Saturday morning in April of last year. Remember that when we thought the pandemic might last weeks or a few months? We'll be months? done by Easter. We'll be done with know, Easter. Exactly. <laughs> and I was already stressed out. You know, my work had all fallen off a cliff because I speak for a living. This was April of last year and I hadn't yet recovered all of that. So I'm just like trying to hustle and check my traps as my family would say, like check the options and opportunities that are coming my way through my phone. So it's a Saturday morning. I'm rolled over in bed you know, I'm still in bed horizontal, but I've, my phone is on my bedside table where it charges and I'm, I'm doing work, you know, on my phone from my bed while still horizontal. So Dan, who's next to me, rolls over, presses his forehead into my back. He can feel the stress slaking off of me. I have, it's a Saturday morning and yet it might as well be sort of Monday at nine, you know, and he presses his forehead into my back. And he says, baby, what can I do to make today easier for you? Oh, wow. Ooh, Lord have wow. mercy. And I have told that story since that moment. And often because I'm giving talks to parents about how can we be better for our kids and blah, blah, blah. And, and I'm always returning the focus to how can you get better within yourself so that you can show up for your kids, and your partner, the way you want. So I tell the story and everyone in the chat is like, how can I find a Dan? Does Dan have a husband, uh, a brother? Does Dan have a brother? And I would chuckle and say, I think the better question is, how can we all be like Dan? Because we all have that capacity mm -hmm. to roll over, you know, and press our foreheads against our partner's backs or to make eye contact and say, baby, what can I do to make today easier for you? Just being asked the question, according to research done by people like Jane McGonigal shows just being asked, how can I help? lifts people's day, mm -hmm. let alone doing the thing that actually would help. Okay. Just caring enough to ask makes people's day improve. So Dan is a beautiful example of a human being. And in the book, I want to show you this. Um, I talk about the love notes we've passed back and forth on our bathroom counter um, as a way to stay in love over time. Look, we've been together 33 years, married 28. We have had some down years, particularly when the kids were three and one and everybody needed a diaper or a feeding or a, you know, a nap or something. It's hard to focus on relationship. I mean, we all know this. And Dan and I got this advice to create a small sign that we would have in our bathroom. Oh. So this is our framed bathroom sign. You can see it's sort of been modeled by water drops and whatnot. This is an old sign. It's behind glass. It has a dry erase marker. And we trade this back and forth. He writes on it and puts it next to my side. Oh. I write on it. And we swap it every, I don't know, there's no requirement. Sometimes it takes two weeks before someone wipes it off and writes something new. But he gave me for Mother's Day a collection of photographs of the notes we have written oh. over years to one another. And they say things like, I love you because um, you fill me with bountiful, you fill me with beautiful energy. I love you because you don't judge me. I love you because um, we built this to last. I love you because you wanted the kind of man that I wanted to be. 
And we have just changed this thing back and forth now for 12 or 15 years, I think. And it is how we've stayed in love through it all because we've chosen to see the small things. And that's the lesson. It's in the book, in the chapter on start talking to strangers, humans are key to your survival, which is really about relationships from strangers all the way to your lover and how to stay connected and in love over time is not about Valentine's day or dinner on your anniversary. It is the small moments of noticing somebody looking them in the eye in the bathroom or in the kitchen and basically saying, I see you. I appreciate, you know, I appreciate that you came home early. I appreciate that you fixed that. I love the way you are with our son, tiny little things. Mm -hmm. We're all so hungry to be seen and we've got to be better at that with our, the people with whom we're in closest relationship. That's my long answer. I love that bigger, you know, that's like tip of the iceberg about who Dan is, but I wanted to give a flavor of it because I, I aspire to be more like him. And I think we all should. That's beautiful. That is just beautiful. So you and I, as, as our listeners might know, are part of a a number of different groups together. And uh, I I remember one really funny exchange where you were explaining this, what he asked you, how could I make your day better? And one of our colleagues, who's a woman said, uh, oh, so I asked my husband that, and he looked at her and said, what have you done with my wife? That was pretty exactly. funny. <laughs> Which is funny. And it says, wow, what you just said by way of asking that question was such such a shift uh, from what I normally experience with you. Right. right. And um, I love that. It was frank and true. And I think, you know, we want to say, like, yeah, I'm I'm learning, I'm offering you what I think you might need, but guess what? I also want it too. <laughs> right. Maybe we can level up if we both begin to be more intentional in these ways. Yeah. I think, I think that's terrific. You have a bit in the book um, on money, which I think is great because that's like one of life's last taboos, right? <laughs> and talking about, you know, not being perfect, getting into credit card debt, having to be bailed out by family. <laughs> and I think a lot of young people stumble on that. Um, and I love the line, you know, don't take on revolving credit card debt. That's how they get you, <laughs> you know? Yeah, Rita, look, this was one of the chapters my editor forced me to put in here. And I, of course, a book on adulting, which we've said is the phase of life you you are in if you survive childhood. So it's just, this book is on living your best life. This book is ostensibly for young people who are struggling to say, I don't want to adult, I can't adult, I don't know how. But in the five weeks of this book's life, I've heard from so many older people, late 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, like this book is for me. And I think the book is a mirror to the reader. It shows you what you need to see. So my editor said, you got to have a chapter on money. And I said, who am I to tell anybody about money? I don't know about money. (laughs) She's like, you can't write a book on adulting and not talk about 401ks. And I was like, okay. So this was the one where I really had to go uh, well out of my own sphere of expertise and draw upon the wisdom of others. And, And I speak in this chapter to the fact that money is emotional. I mean, you've sat with me for 25 minutes you already know me, Rita, your listeners and audience now know me a little bit more. You know, I'm an emotional person. You can tell based on how I speak. So here I am in the money chapter saying, oh, hey, there's a lot of emotion around money and getting a little clearer on that. Like what is the emotional soundtrack running through your mind as you think about your money? It was put there by your parents, your family, how they handled money, the judgment, the shame, the desires, the, you know, the need, the lack, all of that in anime, you know, it's there and your it's your soundtrack. It's playing as you're thinking about how you earn, what you earn, how you save, how you spend your debt, et cetera, your goals. I also talk about how as a young person, you've got to be thinking about yourself at 60 plus who will be so grateful if you manage to plan ahead, right? I talk about, I talk about compounding interest. I give so many examples of specifics about what you can do to plow that, you know, just get those seeds deeply planted and wow, how they'll grow. But I also say, you must not be an indentured servant to your 60 year old self. So the, one of the deep themes of the book is balance, right? It's work and life. It's mind and body. It's 
take care of yourself now and think about your future self who will have wanted you not to have blown it all at this age. And so there's just, and then finally, I think the sh- what comes out in that chapter is the shame that many of us who are highly educated feel. We're like, why don't I understand money better? Nobody taught me this. I've got degrees from these places, but I don't really get how this works. And in this chapter, as every chapter does, it concludes with stories of other humans I'm, I've put their life story on the page to demonstrate how humans get through all this stuff. And one is the story of a dancer in New York City, a professional dancer. She's had great gigs in Orange is the New Black, backup dancer for Beyonce. But you don't earn very much. You get paid for your gig and then you're done. And then and she had all the student debt because she majored in dance, undergrad, and got an MFA. She's living in one of the most expensive cities in the world. She's got 30 plus thousand in principal to be 50,000 in in debt with the interest. And she commits to being debt-free, debt-free Danae is what she calls herself and ends up, you know, making the social post about it. And like, I'm going to be debt-free by by my 30th birthday or 32nd birthday, whatever it was, even though I'm only making this much money and my debt is this much, I'm going to do it. And people started to, she didn't get any comments to her Facebook message. She got a lot of likes but no comments. But where did the comments show up? Privately in her messaging. So many people said, how are you doing it? Tell me, I need to know. And she realized my friends can't even say publicly on my Facebook page, I'm struggling also. Can I get some advice? There's so much shame. Long story short, she does get debt free. She rents a rent the runway dress and goes into the subway with a sign in New York City pre-pandemic with a sign that says, hug me, I'm debt free. And a friend videos it and she gets hugs from strangers and she's now developed a financial planning uh, certificate. You know, she's in that profession now, which is her backup side hustle for when she's not doing a dance gig. She's decided I can teach other people, maybe people like me, black, first generation, grew up working class, Fort Worth, Texas. You know, she now has a body of knowledge that many of her peers lack and it's become a side career for her. It's just such a beautiful story. That is a great story, really great story. So something that I really don't want us to shortchange time on is, um, you know, we're in this incredibly unusual moment. And, you know, I think about it in terms of inflection points, right? So we've got four, right? We've got the pandemic, obviously. We've got climate change that's been getting to be to the point where we really can't deny it anymore. Uh, we have an economic you know, crisis, um, which is great for some people and awful for some people. But the one that I think uh, I know is very close to your heart is a crisis of social justice and equity. And I know you've been doing some work on that. I think you know, I'm, a lot of my peers are very, um, what's the right word? confused, I would say. Like, there's no clarity. We don't want to do the wrong thing, but we don't know what to do. And, and I think to the extent you bridge that, that that's just super helpful for people to have an honest conversation about. So when you say a lot of my peers, do you mean white folks? Do you mean white women? Oh, I mean like white New Jersey housewives. <laughs> like, <you know? laughs> white New Jersey housewives, right? <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Um, I mean, I have a lot of peers who aren't that, but that's the group I'm thinking of. Right, right. Um, Rita, these are really, really tough times. I think we can be certain that we are living through a period that will be written about. Mm -hmm. You know, a hundred years from now, I think this this time in, in America will turn out to have been pivotal. Um, I, um, am, as I've said, black and biracial. I have my, my middle book, my- Oh, you know, we haven't talked about that at well, all. Well, it's, it's, it's called, called, Real, time, it's called Real American, right? Yeah, Real American is yeah. my memoir on yeah. being black and biracial in mostly white spaces growing up, in schools, places I've chosen to work. I'm a privileged person. I was raised middle class. Uh, my father was a physician. I've already said that. Um, and yet racism found me, as did microaggressions. And really um, plunged me into a deep place of self-loathing. I was called the N-word on my 17th birthday at my old white high school in Middleton, Wisconsin, and really spent from 17 to about 37, just trying to not be called the N-word again. So I was doing a lot of performing the part of a black person the white people could tolerate or appreciate. And that was just heaped on 
um, a big vat of self-loathing. And I ultimately did the work to move out of self-loathing to self-love, which I talk about in the book a little bit. Um, and so I have, um, I, I have had this experience of being the other. And um, I love the fact that we are so much more conscious as Americans writ large of all ethnicities and races of the fact that we lead vastly different lives depending on the color of our skin and our socioeconomic status. I'm quite aware that as a now upper middle class, black and biracial person, highly educated, I have not in any way, shape or form had the typical black experience. But in writing this memoir, I think it was my way of saying, and don't delude yourself that education and money lifts you, uh, protects you from the racists. In fact, sometimes they're more incensed um, or they come at you differently. Like you don't deserve to be where you are. You're not really right. And, um, and so um, I am delighted that there is a deepening awareness in the minds and hearts of folks who haven't um, had cause to be concerned about these things for most of their lives. Um, it is wonderful. It was in the wake of George Floyd's murder, wonderful to hear so many people in my life, my extended family, community, friends, acquaintances, business colleagues, this sort of, whoa, wow. It was wonderful because there was all of this energy and concern. And yet it came with this real sadness. Like, where have you been? Where have you been and why were you not outraged before, 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 before? And I'm not even going to name the names because there are so many. And um, so we're in a reckoning moment. We're in a reckoning around mattering. And this tension between Black lives matter, no, all lives matter. It's so false. It's like, yes, all lives are supposed to matter, but we have increasing evidence shot on video that all lives don't matter. And so in order for all lives to matter, we say Black lives matter. We're not trying to be Black supremacists. We're trying to say, can't Black lives matter, comma, two, question mark, you know? And of course, we see what what happens to so many different communities. The, the uh, murders of Asian folk in Atlanta was yet another reminder that Asians are targeted. targeted. Um, and um, we've seen, you know, the synagogue in Pittsburgh. Uh, there was a massacre there, right? Jews are targeted, and and so many of us are targeted on the basis of, I mean, trans people targeted just on the basis of our identity. And my goodness, Rita, here we are in the 21st century and we've sent machines to Mars and we've decoded some of the human genome. So we've gone nano and we've gone, you know, macro universal. Why can't we heal these ancient divisions of us, them, between us and our fellow humans? I hoped naively, that the pandemic posed an existential threat, the virus would bring us humans together. And it instead has simply highlighted and deepened so many places in which we find division. So my work is at the individual level. I think person to person conversation, sharing of stories about your life, my life is what leads to deeper understanding and what erodes the barriers and the hate Others do work at the level of policy and advocacy and elect the right people and vote for the right. I believe in all of that, donate. But my work is at the level of storytelling and connection and trying to just show up mutually respectful, listening, caring. I believe we have the power to transform and level up our human experience around climate change and around income inequality and around this pandemic and around social justice and systemic racialized violence. If we can dare to care about one another, those who look different than us, if we can dare to see each other as ourselves, to see each suffering child as our own child, then we won't be able to do anything but make things better because our hearts will just ache until we don't, if we don't, yeah, until we do. And do you, do you see progress? I think I do. I mean, the awakening in the murder of, in the wake of the, the awakening in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, I think was progress. And I see corporations shifting their practices around hiring and around around how to create a workplace culture that sees all. I mean, I. I hear people talking about, you want to really change your workplace environment? 
find out how the trans people of color are faring. If you have trans people of color in your workplace, as a manager, as a C-suite person, go to them, humble yourself and say, you know what? I don't know what it's like to be you here, but I want to know that you can thrive here. And I'm curious if you're willing to share and feel safe sharing with me. I would love to know where in this company do you feel you can be fully you Mm -hmm. and where do you not? Mm -hmm. Because I am committed to working on the where do you not feel you can be fully you. That's what we mean by inclusion. That's what we mean by belonging. And checking in with those among us, whether in the workplace or a family or a neighborhood or a school, those among us who are most marginalized, if we who have more power, more privilege, for whatever reasons, can take an interest in those who have the least, um, then we can really make changes that that transform things for the whole. And I do see a lot of progress, yes. That's, but we have so much more to do. And there's, of course, a huge backlash, yeah. Well, yeah, and I'm I'm I, I'm concerned about the backlash and and the sort of the you know whitewashing almost of, of like yeah 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 we're doing that we're checking the box but it's sort of a surface level kind of exchange. One of the things I talk to CEO and C-suite people about in general is it is so easy to be in your own bubble and to just not see uh, at a broader level. And I talk a lot about the need to get out to the edges and really. Um, explore what, you know, because where these big changes are happening is not, you know, politely on the conference table at corporate headquarters, you know, it's, it's beyond where you normally interact. Um, yeah, it big, uh, a big topic. And uh, I, I hope we come out of this with more understanding, you know, with a better and richer um, sense of what we can do. I mean, what the other thing I hear a lot is people kind of throwing up their hands, almost metaphorically saying, you know, it's just such a big problem. There's nothing I can do. And you're taking a different take on it. You're saying there are things you can do. There are conversations you can have. There are actions you can take, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe. what advice would you give someone who's well-intentioned but doesn't know what to do? Right. Uh, well, sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> I give that right. so far. <laughs> Well, it's important to point that out, right? Because there's you know, there's well-intentioned black people who, uh-huh. you know, and, and throwing up their hands, like, I don't know what, I, what, what to do. And, uh-huh. um, and I think, um, you know, I think for those who have been accustomed to being in the majority, who've always had their narratives splashed across television screens and movie screens and novels have been centered around them. It's educate yourself about the experiences of people who aren't like you. Read memoir of people not like you. Read novels situated in experiences that are not like yours. Consume television and movies. Listen to podcasts um, that give you exposure to lives that are different than your own. I think that's a challenge I I would ask of all of us. I would also, and that's sort of what you can do that feels active, um, challenging your implicit bias. I mean, the work of Jennifer Eberhardt, J- Dolly Chug around implicit bias, um, you know, knowing that we are all biased based on how we're raised. Don't be ashamed that you have bias, but seek to do something about it. Um, there's research that shows that white women expect others to part for them when they're walking down the sidewalk in a busy city. Okay. Isn't that fascinating? So I've decided to confront that outside the pandemic. I would walk through the streets of New York and just, and test this out. And um, so these are you know, like, but what did you find? Oh, that sometimes white women would bump into me. Wow. If, if just, they just kept talking amongst themselves, expecting, expecting. And if I just stopped and not, so I didn't, I wasn't the body moving into theirs because that would have caused all kinds of trouble, but just, you know, would they look up and notice that a person was there? Huh. Um, anyway, anecdotal example, but the point is like challenge your assumptions. Who are you expecting to hold the door for you? Whom are you expecting to part for you so you can keep going? That goes back to Jim Crow days of like black people had to step off the sidewalk into the, into the trough, into the dirt road to make room for white people, white women in particular coming down the street. Who do you sit next to in a bus? Who do you sit next to in a sidewalk? I mean, in an elevator. Um, These are tiny little things you can start to notice about the assumptions you just, one just has baked in. Mm -hmm. Ask yourself this deeply intimate question. Do I see black and brown people as fully human? And everybody listening will say, of course I do, you know, I have black friends, I have brown, you know, Mm -hmm. of course I'm right. And I'll push it and say, all right, great. If so, how do you know? Where's the evidence? How does it show? Mm -hmm. If someone was to knock on your door and ask your kids, I'm doing a survey. Do your parents see black and brown people as fully human? 
what would your children say and what evidence would they point to either way? Mm -hmm. And my second tough question is, what are you doing to make your world kinder and safer for black and brown people? And your world could be your business, your school, your neighborhood, your family, um, your friend group. Um, that is where the work is. Uh, what are you actively doing to stand up? You know, white folks who have friends and family and colleagues who are saying hateful, harmful, awful things, you are the bridge we're counting on. You know, we're not, I'm no, those people are never going to listen to me, but they might listen to you. Mm -hmm. So we're counting on you to summon your bravery. It's hard to stand up to racists and bigots and fascists and white supremacists. It's hard, but we're in that moment where bravery and guts are required. Mm. And I think that's one of the things we will look back on this time as, and it's amazing to me how people do rise to the occasion. You know, you, you hear about it on college campuses, you hear about it in, in small towns where people are saying this, this, we've got to, we've got to change this path that we're on. Yeah. Very yeah. So Rita, may I say, that's why, yes. back to my book for a second. Yeah. Um, so I've written this nonfiction you have, book. You have, you have a chapter in the book. It, well. But you have a chapter it, on the book, Make Things Better From Your Town to the World Beyond. But I'm going to go to the back of the book, okay. actually, where I have my commitment to inclusion, where I describe, so if you've got it, it's page, where did they put it? Let's see. La, 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 la. Um, oh, here it is. Uh, page 468. Yeah. My commitment to inclusion in your turn, how to be an adult. And um, Missy put yeah. the link up in the chat, which is great. This is me saying, oh, hey, reader. Um, I really made an effort here to write a book that is about a stage of life all humans go through by making narrative choices that are inclusive of all humans. So first of all, my own narrative language doesn't make assumptions about your gender, doesn't make assumptions about that you're neurotypical, doesn't make assumptions that you lack a mental health condition. No, my narrative is constantly making references. I might be in a chapter on money, but I might acknowledge that this will be hard for you if you have social anxiety. You know, like I'm, I'm acknowledging difference around race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, degree of education, mental health situation, it's religion, et cetera. I am, I am deeply inclusive in my writing and my narrative choices and I've put stories in these pages. I've already shared with you the story of Danae in the money chapter. There are 31 humans whose stories animate these pages and they are representative of all of those categories and ways of living that I just described and plenty more. And that's my way of saying, if we want all lives to matter, then we have to take those of us who have historically not had books written about us or we have not been included in the examples and we've got to bring those stories onto the center of the page. And so my hope is that every reader will have cause to say at some point, wow, how did she know I was going through that? How well, She had me in mind when she wrote this paragraph, page, chapter. Um, I have tried. I, I, you can't ever get 100% there. But my intention has been write a book um, that really does speak to, for, and about all of us. That's brilliant. That is just brilliant. Um, I will say I notice now, like if I'm reading a book and it only features, you know, white male protagonists, I notice, I notice. Right. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. I think that's, that's a change. It is. And whiteness, um, Rita, has tended to linger um, silently on the page. So very often journalists, journalists to novelists, like the, the hardest nonfiction folks to the most speculative fiction folks often only name race when the character is non-white. Well, as a black and biracial person, I've had five decades of reading books and stories like this, where it's character A, I'm told about character A, character B, character C, character D, whose brown skin glistened in the sun. All of a sudden I'm told, oh, now we're talking about race. What am I to assume about ca characters A, B, and C? Well, clearly the writer thinks that they and I are in cahoots on what the race of these three are because it's just so implicit. We don't have to state it. That's how whiteness lurks as the norm to which the rest of us show up as the other. Mm -hmm. And I am not here for that. I am here to completely subvert that. And I name everyone's identities 
as my, my storytellers wanted me to, I, I, I didn't label them. I asked, how do you identify? And they told me, and I put that on the page in order to say, you know, if race is relevant, it is relevant for us all. And there is no set of humans who are normal and, um, and get to just be called by their name and told what they do for a living. No, there, if you would say, if you're going to list somebody's race, cause they're black, brown, Asian, et cetera, you know, you should also say, oh, and this person is white. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a yeah. lot of sense. So um, sort of larger questions of overcoming divisiveness. And of course, race is one. Um, but, you know, uh, I had uh, Tim Harford and I were talking about this and he said, you know, one thing you can do is if somebody's got a firmly held belief and you want to shift that belief is just ask them to explain how it works, right? <laughs> and and but the, the sheer act of having to consciously explain yourself um, oh, there it is. There you go. <laughs> well, you know, this is um, actually uh, Irshad Manji's book, Don't uh-huh. Label Me, oh, uh-huh. uh, An Incredible Conversation for Divided Times, and Dolly Chug's book, uh, uh-huh. The Person You Mean to Be, How uh-huh. Good People Fight Bias. And both of these women um, will make the point, as Tim has, that um, you've, you know, listening, showing up with a humble curiosity, not listening like, why don't you tell me what you think, right? But like, oh. I'd really like to, to understand where you're coming from. If you can get to a place of genuine desire around that, you know, they might just let you know, and you can actively listen to reflect back what you've heard. Then you've demonstrated how a respectful conversation should go. So hopefully they will then reciprocate. That is the way forward in difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, fallback techniques if you get into one of those and it's not a respectful or <laughs> honest or authentic conversation? Um, I'm s- sad to say, I don't have the model example or answer right now, but it is the true one. Um, I have been retreating from those situations mm-hmm. in the, in the last year I have found it uh, intolerable. I have found that I can't emotionally regulate myself. So I need to leave. Mm-hmm. Um uh, but I know I am capable of doing that work. Mm-hmm. Um, it does. I'm, I'm acknowledging that it is an emotional lift to sit with somebody who has very different views, particularly if those views really feel quite um, demeaning of you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are people in my very extended family who really have views on black lives that I find quite troubling and I've just had to walk away. Mm because I can't bring myself to, I, I'm so wounded by the fact that they don't seem to care mm. about my son, right? So I, 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 and they wouldn't phrase it that way, but that is how, right? So mm-hmm. I have decided I can't take that one on. It mm-hmm. is safer for me emotionally to say, it. you know what? I'm not shutting them out of my life, but I am choosing not to engage. And sometimes that's the best choice. Mm -hmm. Um, But yes, I I think I am in other realms quite capable and really enjoy just getting to know somebody across differences. And Mm -hmm. um, I, I, uh, uh, you know, there are all kinds of people like the folks I've, we've talked about who are sharing the techniques for how we do that. Mm, Okay. Okay. Very interesting. So um, what are you working on now? I mean, I guess right now it's just the, the book, right? 24 seven. You know what, Rita? Um, my mother and I have co-owned a home with my husband for 21 years to afford living in Palo Alto, to get our kids to the right public schools, air quotes. We went in on home together and it is a heck of a thing to decide to move in with your grown daughter or to move in with your mother when you are grown. And um it has been full of upsides, as everyone can imagine, around childcare and cooperation and meal making and, you know, laundry, like, you know, and it has been deeply challenging as well. And my mother and I are ready to write a mother daughter memoir. Oh. This. So this is something I'm working on the book proposal right now. And um, it's going to be told in alternating narratives. So she, her voice in a chapter, then mine, and then hers, and then mine. We're not going to try to agree on the page. We're not going to try to tell a story from the same perspective. We're just going to talk about who we were before we made this choice 
And then the deep depths of the muck of it, the during years, we call it before, during, after is the, is the setup. And then after is, you know, how we did the work to be mutually respectful, loving women who could coexist more or less peacefully. We've done that work and we think we have something to offer others um, who find themselves in multi-generational situations out of choice or circumstance, out of pandemic or other reasons, right? Um, I believe you you publish memoir to try to be of service. Mm-hmm. That is certainly what my memoir on, on race is, is trying to be, mm-hmm. trying to be of service to those who have felt alone in these similar experiences. And that's what my mother and I are working on. So she's already done her sample chapter. She's way ahead of me. I'm like picking up the rear here, like got to do my sample chapters, get my proposal together. But I am hoping that that book will, um, will be a book. I'm hoping that that idea will be a book and that it will be out in a couple of years. If I have my way, that's what'll happen. And that's what I'm working on next. That's super exciting. Really exciting. Well, one of the things that I've talked to um, people like uh, Aviva Wittenberg Cox, for example, um, about women's lives, you know, and, and, and the arc of women's lives. And one of the things she's pointed out is that for a lot of us now, you know, our fifties, sixties, even our seventies are, are actually our golden years. You know, that's when we've kind of got a lot of the things that occupy that, you know, that left-hand part of your brain. (laughs) It's always worrying about something or other. And that just lessens. It doesn't ever go away, but it lessens. Uh, And that really frees you up then to, to do um, cool new things. Absolutely. And I think that is uh, a message I'm implicitly trying to send in my book for young people is sort of that Trevor project mantra. It gets better. The older we get, the more in charge we can be of our journey, of ourselves, our choices, our work, with whom we're in relationship and not. And the less worried we are about the judgment of others, which is not to say we become narcissists, but rather we we fill ourselves with our own self-love so we are less needy of the approval of others. As women, we are raised to please, we are raised to be docile we're raised to be performative and as women the older we get we certainly have the capacity to shed that whether we do is a function of how hard we work for it i think um but we do at some point come into our own through age and stage and um and then i think rita the desperate yearning hope is Please let me live long enough now that I know who I am and I love that self. Please, universe, God, whomever you (laughs) plead to, please just let me now live long enough in this self-loving space. Mm. And that is, I think, the sweet spot of life, to know and accept the self to be able to be that self, therefore in harmony with others, because you're no longer in this needing, looking for, angry at, you're just like, whatever happens out there, I, I got this. I belong to me, therefore I'm okay wherever I go. I think that's, you know, that's the, that's the destination. Yeah, nobody ever wrote on their epitaph, oh, made senior vice president at the age of 23. <laughs> I mean, that's not Never. what you're living your life for, right? So uh, any last um, suggestions? My goodness, wow, that time flew by. Um, Any last sort of things you'd really want people to carry away and obviously get the book. So terrific book, very rich, thick book um, with lots of stories, very readable book, you know, really very human and and readable. Um, Any last bits of sort of those who are listening, what should they be thinking of next? Um, Just gratitude to you, first of all, for the opportunity. Second, I would say that while this book is pitched at 18 to 34 year olds, I have been delighted to hear from older folks that they're seeing themselves in it. I've been delighted to hear from young people that if they're reading it alongside a parent or they, you know, they each have a copy, they're both sort of reading it or they're swapping one copy back and forth. The young people are seeing it as a portal to open a conversation with a parent that might have otherwise been hard to start or impossible. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the book is functioning as a neutral third party that is supporting the younger person in having some difficult conversations, which I love. I just love that because I'm trying to be of use. I'm trying to root for all of us to make it right. So if I've offered something that is a tool 
you know, that humans can use. Um, I'm delighted by that. Mm -hmm. and, and on the flip side, I would say to those who are older might be interested in reading it with their 20 something or teen or 30 something, you know, adult child. Um, as you read it, even though it wasn't written to you, for you, the narrative is for a younger person, um, ask yourself, okay, so what, what can I take from this such that I am better able to walk alongside my young adult, offering them whatever I need to without micromanaging their lives or completely walking away from them. I'm hoping that this book is teaching that even though it does not explicit, it's not explicitly about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I love the way you talk about adulting as a process. Yeah. You know, that it's not, it's not like check the box. You've turned 18. Now you're a grown up. It's like all these steps you have to go through to really come into your own, uh, which I think a lot of people don't spend enough time on um, thinking about just, you know, what is that milestone now? Uh, and how I'll never... Failure is failure, right? That it's not about perfection. It's not about you're done. You will learn and grow. I hope until you draw your last breath, <laughs> because if you don't, you are a perfectionist or you are forever in your comfort zone, or you are just in this place of stasis, which is the antithesis of living a life. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. That is brilliant. Well, thank you so much for clearing your calendar for us for an hour. Um, this has been wonderful and amazing and emotional. And uh, I just really appreciate spending some time with you. Thank you. Rita, thank you so much. And thanks to everybody who chose to join us. Really appreciate um, folks showing up and, and leaning in and listening. Really, thank you to everyone. Have a great rest of your day.